I'd like to introduce uh, John E. Joy from Stanford, who will tell us about uh, benchmarking highly entangled states on a large scale analog quantum simulator. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John He. So, first of all, I'd like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me to give a talk here. So, it's a great pleasure to share uh, our um, recent work, which is in collaboration with uh, Michael Andrews Group at Caltech and also Sunman Choi at MIT. So, today I'll be talking about the benchmarking uh, the highly entangled state on a large scale analog quantum simulator. So here's the outline of our talk. So firstly, I'd like to introduce you to the, uh, our high fidelity at temporary quantum simulator. Okay, so as we all know, we are literally entering a very exciting kind of era where we can harness quantum technologies to demonstrate various quantum applications, ranging from quantum computing and simulation to quantum network and metrology. So basically, the ultimate goal here, here is to demonstrate these quantum applications with quantum devices that could potentially outperform the classical counterparts. And in order to achieve this goal, the, here the key challenge is to create and control the large-scale entanglements. But however, in, in reality, the creating or producing the large-scale entanglements is a very challenging and daunting task, which can be illustrated in the following um, the simple Kind of picture. So here, typically, um, we, uh, when it comes to the analog quantum simulator, we start with a simple the inches state of qubits prepared in the ground states, and then we uh, typically perform uh, the quantum gates or you know apply this quantum evolution to create a useful entangled state at a later time. However, experimental quantum devices are not isolated from the environment, and because of the presence of uh, noise and matters. Uh, the entanglements will be destroyed, and therefore uh, it is very challenging to scale up the size of the entanglements. And, and moreover, if you think about um, the larger scale quantum devices, uh, it is more prone to have these errors, so therefore it is a big challenge. So here the challenge is basically to create these high entangled states with high fidelity. So to address this challenge, um, as we heard from the earlier talks, we also employ these optical tweezers uh, as our you know, quantum hardware to prepare the single atoms trapped in optical tweezers. And as we uh, learned from the earlier talks, in these neutral atoms, we can find a kind of effective two-level system or qubits, for example, by using the ground and the Rydberg states. And these Rydberg states are very promising kind of ingredients for quantum simulations because that allows us to achieve the strong interactions between adjacent uh, atoms. For example, this also uh, allows you to create, uh, for example, maximally entangled uh, bell states uh, using a very simple approach. In particular, uh, at um, my Landers group at Caltech, over the past few years, we have pioneered a new platform by using uh, alkali earth atoms, uh, strong atoms, trapped in optical tweezers. So uh, we, for the first time, demonstrate a lot of um, interesting applications ranging from the, the narrow line cooling, the uh, high fidelity imaging, and also atomic clocks and tweezers, as well as the high fidelity ripper operations. So due to the limited time today, so I'll be focusing only on high fidelity ripper operations. So in this uh, alkali earth or strontium atom, so here's the, um, the simplified uh, energy diagram. So instead of working with the actual ground states, we actually define an effective ground states by using the metastable excited states, which is known as the clock states. And then you can apply a single photo excitation to populate the rigid states. And then using this um, uh, effective two-level manifold, we have demonstrated you know, highly coherent, high fidelity, the single qubit mark oscillation, uh, showing this beautiful um, the cosine uh, oscillation in popular dynamics, and also you can prepare the two qubit at a close distance, uh, and then because of strong interaction between two qubits, when you perform the rocky oscillation dynamics, it allows you to prepare a uh, the, you know, maximally entangled bell state at a certain time. And as shown here, using the simple um, of, you know, rocky punch dynamics, and due to the fact that the strong chemo atoms offer uh, very you know, interesting and useful uh, the features when it comes to quantum simulation, we are able to demonstrate really extremely high fidelities in uh, many different uh, aspects. And uh, recently, um, 
we actually re revisit this two qubit entanglement problem because recently there is an interesting uh, idea regarding so called like, erasure detection. So, as I mentioned earlier, we work with this kind of uh, effective two level manifold, which is slightly in the excited uh, states. And then, if some undesired errors, for example, spontaneous decay happens, then population will go to the absolute ground state, which can be detected by adding additional the emission light. And then this, when you see this kind of fluorescence uh, from this imaging light, then you can actually head out this kind of error detection, which, you, which allows us to post-select the measurement data sets. And using this newly developed technique, we are actually able to further improve this dial state generation fidelity from two nines to three nines uh, with this back correction. And then more remarkably, actually more importantly, we believe that we understand the remaining uh, infidelities of this, uh, of, of this operation up to like one to, uh, 10 to the minus 3 level. And then as you can see here, uh, we actually strongly believe that there's a room for further improvements for improving uh, these two cubic entanglements. Uh, another question is like, uh, so here so far we have demonstrated like fidelities of single qubit and two qubit operations. But when it comes to large scale quantum simulation, we have to work with kind of many body quantum states. So when it comes to larger quantum systems, then how can we benchmark those kind of highly entangled large scale quantum states? So, um, so here basically I'm talking about the quantum device benchmarking on a system level. Okay, so fidelity uh, is basically referred to as a comparison between the theory and experiments. And typically, when it comes to fidelity estimation, in theory, you run, uh, basically, you solve this Schrodinger equation. And then, for example, here, you can perform the quench dynamics, starting from the initial product state. And later time, the highly entangled, the pure state, will be produced. But in contrast, in experimental systems, when you program the same Hamiltonian and the run the dynamics in experiments, because of noise and errors, uh, you will end up having a mixed state, not a pure state. So therefore, the formally speaking, the fidelity can be defined as a state overlap between the, the theoretical pure state and the experimental the mixed state. In other words, it can be also understood as a probability of having no errors in experiments. But, but, but when it comes to estimating fidelities, you immediately notice that you are asked to uh, reconstruct the uh, density matrix. And the reconstruct the density matrix is very uh, expensive, expensive, and therefore it's not a scalable method for larger quantum systems. So hence, we needed a different approach to benchmarking the you know, larger scale quantum devices without relying on uh, the quantum state tomography techniques. And recently, uh, we actually developed a very simple protocol to estimate this global fidelity of you know, large quantum systems. So here, uh, the protocol is as follows. So first, you prepare uh, the initial target state, and then here the target state doesn't need to be a, you know, the simple the product state. You can actually prepare any target state that you want to benchmark against with other uh, theory. And then sub subsequently, you add a, another Hamiltonian to induce the quench dynamics. And after a short, you know, uh, time, you can produce a kind of different, but highly entangled uh, the quantum states. And then uh, if you think about, um, you know, performing the projective measurement, local projective measurement, on this kind of uh, later time wave function, the right hand side shows the uh, expected reference state. So uh, indeed, when we uh, consider this Ripper analog Hamiltonian, we can choose the Hamiltonian evolution such that it can uh, rapidly increase the entanglement over time. So as you can see, so initially the entanglement develops linearly in time until it's that and until it is saturated by the finite system size. And therefore, if you keep increasing system size, and then if you think about, you know, bringing in like some classical algorithm to benchmark such large states, so up to, up to certain time scale, the classical you know, algorithm can offer the good simulation fidelity. However, after some critical time, the simulation fidelity will also drop because of limited um, uh, these capabilities. So therefore, um, in other words, we can actually think about you know, available classical algorithms when it comes to this benchmarking you know, task. And for example, there's actually good you know, numerical algorithms which offers the, the perfect fidelity uh, up to certain short times. However, when you consider the large and the long time regime, so we actually find that there are you know, very limited you know, the choices of classical algorithms, and all of them will end up you know, showing the limited fidelity as well. 
So despite this challenge, we wanted to find the best classical algorithms uh, we can think of in order to benchmark our one-dimensional uh, Rydberg quantum simulator. And then we uh, find that this, uh, the matching product fit is a good starting point for benchmarking one-dimensional quantum systems. But we soon realized that this conventional, the standard PVDMPS is actually not uh, optima optimized for our quantum devices. So we, uh, but therefore, we actually have developed a new kind of simulation algorithms uh, based upon this MPS architecture, which we call the light point MPS, to improve the simulation accuracy uh, significantly. So I don't have time to uh, fully explain uh, the details about this algorithm, but please uh, talk to me after this talk, and I'm happy to give more details. So using this uh, light point uh, MPS uh, algorithm, so we first demonstrated the uh, exact benchmarking up to system size 60. And uh, interestingly, uh, this, this plot shows the fidelity as a function of time for various system sizes. And uh, you, you find that uh, for all like, system sizes, at least at short times, the fidelity actually decays follows the exponential decay, where the corresponding decay rates uh, are proportional to uh, the system size. But uh, again, you also find that um, well, for larger systems, there are missing fidelities in the high entanglement regime because we don't find any uh, uh, the exact you know, classical reference to benchmark in this regime. Well, however, we have thought about, oh, what if we just use this kind of classically approximate but efficient algorithms just to benchmark quantum systems, and then that's what we tried. And then, for example, in this kind of MPS algorithms, there's a one tuning knob called like bone dimension, which we can uh, through which you can control the fidelity of the classical simulation. Uh, of course, for small systems, you can actually maximize the bone dimension to have perfect simulation. However, for larger systems, it is actually uh, extremely challenging to have you know, perfect simulation, as I mentioned earlier. But what's interesting here is that if you use this kind of imperfect classical references, then resulting fidelity estimate uh, from the experiment data set, it shows some like a further you know, drop off at, at a later time. So, Qualitatively, we find very interesting observation where the fidelity estimates when we correlate our experiment data with these you know, collective simulation are affected by both experimental true fidelity and the simulation fidelity. So um, this relationship is not you know, exactly uh, true, but inspired by this kind of you know, qualitative observation, we wanted to perform a more systematic kind of studies uh, of of this kind of fidelity estimates and see how it, they vary when we change the uh, simulation fidelity. For example, in this plot, when we do this kind of uh, light point MPS algorithm, you can tune the simulation fidelity by varying bone dimension. And as you can see, how the fidelity estimates uh, changes accordingly. For sure, like for small systems, once you uh, reach this kind of perfect uh, simulation regime, the fidelity estimate will saturate. However, for larger systems, because we cannot increase the bone dimension for larger you know, numbers, so therefore we cannot reach this saturation regime. So however, the not interesting question is that we do have a lot of uh, interesting you know, the data set, right, from this kind of measured fidelity using approximate algorithms. Can we actually just use this kind of um, measured fidelities to infer the true fidelity in this kind of inaccessible high entanglement regime? So in order to uh, learn this true fidelity from the largest distance size we tried. We actually first tried a bunch of methods, but we ended up using uh, this kind of learning approach based on this neural network. So here is basically, uh, we are just training this kind of neural network by using these three parameters, the bone dimension and time and system size, and then we uh, were able to kind of train the neural network such that we can predict the fidelities for the, for the regime that is inaccessible by the class algorithms. So when we perform uh, this approach, then we are able to learn uh, the true fidelities um, for, with certain uncertainties for this kind of larger system sizes. And of course, we can also bound these fidelities for larger system sizes using this only time exponential decay, which we call the lower bound. And um, then using this kind of extracted fidelities, now we turn to um, the, the different question of, of entanglement in noisy quantum systems. So first of all, we wanted to first characterize the, the fidelity uh, at entanglement maximum for each system size. For example, entanglement grows, and then we wanted to kind of identify the fidelity of creating such large entanglements. And if you plot out this kind of fidelity uh, at entanglement maximum as a function of system size, 
and we see this following trend. And this following trend is consistent with an uh, equivalent two qubit uh, entanglement fidelity of three, three nines, which is also consistent with the measured two qubit fidelities. And on top of that, more interesting questions as follows. Here, uh, please note that this blue line is the entanglement growth from noiseless the pure state. However, in actual like quantum systems, we do have noise matters. So we are actually wondering what the uh, what the actual entanglement is in noisy quantum systems. So qualitatively speaking, because of noise matters, the entanglement will not grow uh, like you know forever. It will actually turn over at certain times because of limited fidelities. So this is basically understood as a competition between entanglement growth and the error rates. And however. Just computing this so-called like mixed state entangled entropy is a very you know, computationally challenging and, and difficult task. So instead, we actually developed a uh, the more convenient and easy kind of uh, to estimate uh, the proxy of mixed state entanglement lower bound of noise quantum systems. So basically, we can uh, use this kind of proxy to certify the lower bound of you know, noisy uh, the mixed state entanglement of noisy quantum systems. So if we like apply this kind of proxy to the measured fidelities and so on, then as, as indeed as we expected, we still do see this kind of inverted U shape in entanglement growth profile. So this different you know uh, the curves corresponds to different system sizes. So therefore, we can also identify the maximum entanglement we can create for the different system sizes. And therefore, if you now plot such the maximum mixed state entanglement for different system sizes, then this allows us to actually compare our you know, analog quantum devices against other leading platforms of digital quantum computers, uh, for including like uh, supercomputing qubit or check ions. So as you can see, so our Midburn quantum simulators is at least on par with the pre-2023 like, 2023, like uh, this kind of quantum screen style results reported from the other leading platforms. So therefore, we uh, were very happy to see that these analog quantum simulators based on Rydberg atom arrays are also you know, becoming competitive to this kind of leading platforms. So now the, the actual question is then, uh, when we, you know, coming back to the original question, so we wanted to actually use this external quantum device to create the highly entangled state with large uh, entanglement and also high fidelity, right? Then, uh, then you can now uh, ask, can, you know, ultimately, can an external quantum device be better at representing those highly entangled states uh, of matter at certain you know, point, right? So we wanted to estimate basically the competition or the like, required classical cost to simulate such high entangled dynamics. So uh, basically, uh, the question is follows. So interestingly, when you consider such large scale high entangled regimes, these two systems you know, suffer from like, uh, you know, you know, address, right, for different reasons. For example, for experimental quantum systems, its fidelity will be limited by the physical address, but in contrast, in classical simulation, its simulation fidelity will be limited by the approximate errors. So therefore, now you can think about comparing this experimental fidelity uh, against uh, the simulation fidelity. So here, I'm plotting out uh, the, the bunch of simulation fidelities for different uh, bone dimensions, which corresponds to the you know, the different classical computing resources. So in order to basically uh, you know, outperform the external quantum device, therefore you need to increase the bone dimension or equivalent of the classical computing cost. And then you can actually identify the critical, the computing resource in order to beat the external quantum that we reported here in this study. So therefore we can then plot this chi star, the critical classical resource, uh, as a function of system size, and remarkably, we find that even in one-dimensional quantum systems, the required computing cost increases exponentially with the system size. So this basically, this you know indicates that just simulating this high entanglement, uh, the quantum dynamics with you know high fidelity is exponentially costly for classical algorithms. And for example, when it comes to you know just getting the classical you know the quantum state, a uh, classical state. Uh, the classical reference from this classical simulation, it took actually 180 uh, the CPU days when we use a uh, Calvin cluster. And this implies that if you like further improve the fidelity of fidelities of external quantum device, so this will put more you know, hard time in classical quantum simulation. So with that, so I'd like to introduce uh, two ongoing directions we are currently pursuing in uh, manuscript. So one is basically uh, we wanted to kind of also extend 
our studies for higher dimensional quantum systems. So what if we uh, benchmark the 2D quantum systems, right? So which quantum you know, class algorithms should, should we use, right, in order to benchmark these 2D quantum systems, right? So we can actually you know, perform the similar analysis to, be, uh, to identify where you are, right, in, in simulating such large-scale quantum dynamics. And, and ultimately, we're also kind of very excited to see, you know, in the future, where the when once we reach this highly competitive regime using external quantum device, now the external data can serve as reference, right? And then you can then bring in any kind of like cleverly designed clash of algorithms to compare their like, fidelities throughout this kind of shared uh, the data sets. And then we, we, we can kind of call this you know, project or the idea as a kind of quantum meter. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, my uh, postdoc advisor, the Ryan Ventures uh, at Caltech, and also the theory collaboration team. And then lastly, I also started my own group at Stanford in January, so I'm also looking forward to working with uh, brilliant students and postdocs. So please uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. And thank you very much. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering whether you have an idea of how much the experimental area is due to the Hamiltonian being slightly wrong and what are the areas due to actually the appearance? That's, that's a great question. So, first of all, we can actually use this kind of fidelity estimate we developed to calibrate the Hamilton parameters. So, basically, we can always you know, calibrate our quantum device in real time uh, to, to make sure that we always have high fidelities. But on top of that, we, when we run, you know, uh, the measurements, there will be some like uh, some noise in this control like parameters. So currently, actually, we are not limited by the fundamental limit of this atom systems. We are actually limited by the control errors. For example, intensity and frequency of the laser field. In particular, uh, when we uh, this you know program this quant channel tonia, the Rabi frequency is a dominant term. So therefore, the intensity noise or Rabi frequency noise is currently the dominant error source. So if we improve this intensity stabilization of uh, this Ritberg excitation beam, we can actually, we, are, we believe that we can improve uh, the fidelity of this quantum simulator further. Oh, thanks. Hi, thanks for the wonderful talk. I was, uh, among all other things, I was really surprised by the super high fidelity of the two Q gates. Uh, for the erasure detection, my understanding was a lot of portion uh, should go to the magnetization, so it's really hard to detect, detect those. Uh, errors. So, uh, could you comment on like, how, how could you achieve that super high fidelity by erasure conversion? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. So, let me uh, go to this slide. So, basically, as you can see here, um, so when we do this kind of um, uh, the, you know, two qubit basket experiments using this manifold, the dominance errors are as follows. First one is basically there's a finite preparation uh, fidelity. So, first we need to transfer the population from absolute ground state to the clock state. And then this turns out to be kind of one of the dominant error source. And then this can be actually corrected by using this kind of um, uh, the range of detection. So, so the Rydberg state also go to other? Right. So Rydberg state also goes to the, uh, the other black body radiation and also to the, to the ground states. But at least the, 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 the population, the fractional population that goes to the actual ground state can be detected through this range of detection. Just, just to clarify, irregular detection is not able to fully correct all the errors. It can capture some fractional errors, for example, the state preparation and the uh, reverb decay that goes into the, the ground state in the end. Does it make sense? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, very exciting. Can, can you show us the results of the quantum entanglement platforms? You mean the mixed thing entanglement? Good. Or this one. Yeah, so I guess it seems like you're doing a 1D model. So if you just, if you just went to 2D, if you just move like much further up on this curve, that's limiting you from going to two dimensions. Yeah, that's a great question. That's what we are actually trying to kind of like uh, examine more carefully. So just to elaborate more on this kind of entanglement lower bound we developed for the mixed state. So as you can see here, essentially we use the pure state entangled growth, right? So you can actually apply some entangled measure. In this case, we use so-called local negativity to compute the pure state entanglements. And then that is actually kind of um, competing against the fidelity reduction. So as far as you know how the entanglement grows, for example, in 2D systems, right? If you can, you know, kind of predict 
the entanglement flows in two systems, as well as if you can you know, put, you know, measure or identify the resulting fidelity decay in 2D, that using this kind of simple like, proxy that, that allows you to estimate this kind of uh, mixed state lower bound, then you can plot it on this uh, the state plot. So this is how we can we're able to compare our 1D systems against other two-dimensional platforms. That's right. So the, our curve, orange curve, is 1D system, just to clarify. So far we have been working on only on the 1D system, but because if you look at this lower, you know, the proxy, so it does not depend on dimensionality. All you need to know is how the integral rules and the fidelity reduction, then that allows you to compare all the things all together. Like, uh, so it's complicated to calculate the fidelity classically for large systems with large entanglement, and I just wondered if, you know, do you think about using uh, like observables instead of fidelity, which might be a bit more forgiving? Uh, do you think about like using observa calculating observables instead of fidelity? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, in fact, the fidelity estimation is kind of the most extreme case because it captures all the like high order correlations, right? So therefore, we are also interested in just learning kind of local observables, for example, like local magnetization or two-point correlations, which are more relevant to like you know typical quantum simulations, and that these observables you know are likely to exhibit different you know classical coast, and we're actually working on characterizing this you know required classical coast in estimating those physically more relevant observables. Great. So uh, if uh, if there's no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.